My name is Emily Simons. I am a clinical anatomy research fellow here at the Seattle Science Foundation. And recently I had the opportunity to, to do some research um, on surgeons performing self-surgery. And it's a unique narrative, so I'm going to share with you what I've learned. Um, this is in chronological order, and if you're also interested in reading further on this, you can find my paper in the in TRIA, the Transitional Research in Anatomy. Okay. So our um, first step uh, surgeon was Cleaver Medellindi. Um, he performed his own lithiotomy, um, and that was in 1824. He at first made an incision <laughs> and had quite a hard time finding um, the stones that he had. Um, he uh, finally reached the neck of the bladder where he had, where the stone was located and took the stone out. It was about the size of a walnut. Um, and as soon as he was done, um, he had colleagues with him who said he was cheerful and happy the preceding days. Um, and appeared to have no pain from his surgery. Um, he, however, had to have several other lithiotomies, which he decided not to perform himself, <laughs> which probably was a good idea. Um, so next up, uh, we have a Romanian fellow named Alexandre Zascu. Um, he had a left inguinal hernia, um, and he, it was about the size of a hen's egg, um, he attempted <laughs> to administer his own anesthesia um, using a mirror, but um, it took him several injections to actually find the right area. Um, and he, um, it took him about 25 minutes for the anesthesia to set in, and he conducted this procedure, as you can see, in the sitting position. Um, with two guys just kind of watching over him to make sure he didn't pass out. Um, his own surgery took about an hour, and um, he fixed his problem. Uh, next, we have probably the most well-known, if not the second most well-known um, surgeon that performed his own surgery. He um, wanted to reach the heart via his own vasculature. And this German guy went to his professor, like went to the chief of surgery and pleaded with him, can I please do this? And the chief of surgery said, absolutely not. Um, so he went and talked with one of the scrub nurses who then agreed to be the mm, guinea pig <laughs> for this experiment. Um, and he had her on the table um, and started anesthetizing her, but then actually anesthetized himself instead. She kind of came to, realized he had put the catheter up his own arm. <laughs> and so they headed for the um, x-ray machine where she took x-rays of him. And when he was in the x-ray machine getting x-rays of this um, catheterization, um, one of his colleagues walked in and realized what he had done, and they started this big kerfuffle fight. Um, and he was successful at reaching the ventricle of his heart, and then when his boss found out, immediately dismissed him from the hospital. This poor guy had to go work in a, a, as a urologist because his surgical um, license was essentially not, he wasn't able to practice. Um, and then ironically, this hospital that he was practicing at in Berlin then opened up a cardiac catheterization lab. And he, uh, this Dr. Otto von Forstmann later went on to win the Nobel Prize um, for his work in um, vascul cardiac vascularization. And ironically, later he died of an MI, so maybe <laughs> that wasn't a good idea. Um, so then um, this fellow, Dr. Leonid Rosegrav, um, he was a Russian and was on a Soviet expedition in the Arctic where he noticed um, symptoms of um, appendicitis. And he was sort of in a dire position because they were in the middle of winter 
he couldn't um, be flown out or ev evacuated out in any way. And so he had to perform his own um, surgery. And um, so he had to prep the team that he had with him, which included a meteorologist and a driver. <laughs> so the meteorologist retracted for him and the driver held the mirror and he had created his own sterile field and um, instructed his team on how to revive him with epinephrine if necessary. Uh, he was able to reach his appendix about 30 minutes into the surgery um, and he kept having sort of these spells of being dizzy and feeling like he was gonna pass out. So he had to take these pauses every couple minutes to just ensure that he was um, like not going to really have a problem. Um, he did find his appendix. He <laughs> successfully removed it um, and saw that it was black, which obviously indicated that it was a necessary procedure. Um, and he was able to complete it in less than two hours. Um, he noted in his, he created this very accurate account of what he did, and he noted that um, he was still weak and had a fever a few days after surgery, but ultimately went on to survive. Um, and he resumed duties as being the physician for the team two weeks later with no problems. Um, but he did say in his journal that if he hadn't done this surgery, <laughs> he would have probably died. Um, the next surgeon, Dr. Evan O'Keefe, was in New York, um, and he decided to do two surgeries on himself at different times. Um, he did an inguinal hernia repair um, at Kane Hospital in New York, and he wanted to prove that general anesthesia wasn't necessary for local um, procedures and minor operations, so he used himself as a test case. Um, he removed his, his own appendix, propping himself up just like you've seen everybody else do. Um, looking down and uh, he had uh, scrub nurses around him to help him and they were actually were the ones that sewed him up um, and this picture shows him like actually laughing and joking with the scrub nurses um, at the point when he was doing his inguinal hernia repair and was like a few centimeters from the um, his femoral artery so it's kind of crazy that he was so relaxed in this situation which could have been so dire um, this is probably the most well-known modern s surgeon performing self or doctor performing self-surgery. Um, Jerry Lynn Nelson was in Antarctica. She's an American, um, and she had extensive ER training. Um, she went to the South Pole Station, and when she was there, she noticed a, a lump in her left breast, and so she... Um, consulted with doctors in the U.S. via teleconference because it was in the middle of winter and she couldn't be flown out. Um, she did her own um, breast biopsy, removing tissue, but the results were inconclusive. So the U.S. Um, the U.S. Navy flew in and dropped, like they flew over Antarctica and dropped a bunch of supplies for her to do another biopsy and teleconference back with physicians. Um, and it, it, her, her second biopsy actually showed that she had cancer. And so then she self-administered chemotherapy until she could be med backed out. Um, this doctor, Amanda Fielding, um, was a science, like a, not an MD or a surgeon, but she was very well versed in anatomy. Um, and she had been feeling like she had this condition that made her exhausted, and she wanted to um, do this surgery called trepanation, but she went around the whole of the UK trying to get someone to do this surgery, and no one would do it. So she took it upon herself to remove the tiny portion of her skull using a dental drill and um, some glasses to keep the blood out of her eye. And she performed her own trepanation um, and took video of it, which she then um, released to a set of people so they could look at what she did. Um, and later, just a total side note, she went on to run for um, parliament in the UK twice and won. Um, 
And so that's pretty crazy. She, um, during her surgery, she lost about a liter of blood and, but reported that the surgery was incredibly successful and she thinks everybody should have it. <laughs> so self-surgery, what I learned from all this is that self-surgery um, is that it's not very common, but it is an incredible feat of discipline. And um, most of these surgeons had to do it in sort of dire cases but they were able to get incredible perspective about what it's like to be under the knife. And they were also able to document some historical accounts that are just phenomenal if you have the opportunity to read some of their journals or look at their um, videos online. And doing this has actually probably changed some of the ways that anesthesia is performed um, in the OR. And they've pretty much, all these cases have contributed in some way towards advancing the surgical knowledge. That is what I learned from my, my, my research.